There is a treatment exceptionalism for people who use drugs, one which does not respect our fundamental rights nor equity, as the current treatment treats us as subjects to control, rather than as any other population that has a right to health. So I'm really pleased to be co-chairing this session. Um, of course, we'll have a panel of speakers that will be sharing their perspectives and recent development of tools um, from, bro from both practitioner and client perspectives on OAT. And of course, these insights will be critical to listen to, to make the treatment system the way it should be. So I'll just pass over to my co-chair. Oh, hello. Hello, uh, I'm Dr. Christos Kouimtsidis. I am the national coordinator for addressing drugs of Greece. I'm a addiction psychiatrist in profession and I practice uh, in the UK and I have the policy role in, in Greece. It is a great honor uh, for me and Greece to co-sponsor this, this event, uh, part of our efforts to meaningfully uh, involve uh, the civil society into uh, the development of policy, implementation and evaluation. Uh, not an easy process, I have to say. Uh, very pleased for the event today. Uh, I have to say that uh, the starting point for, for me uh, is that the provision of uh, uh, treatment for people who have a drug problem, substance use problem, is not a charity from the part of state is an obligation. Uh, it is an obligation that relies on uh, the human rights access to, to health. Uh, the balance between regulations that uh, control the professionals and the rights and uh, responsibilities of the people receiving treatment uh, is, is at times delicate uh, and relies on clear rules, information and mutually agreed uh, terms. Uh, in, in several countries is called care plan, in other countries is called treatment plan, whatever it is. Clear rules are important, and uh, uh, to that effect, the uh, initiative that uh, the uh, civil society has taken to that effect in today's event, I hope that will contribute to that discussion. So, give it back to Judy for uh, introducing the panel members. Thank you, Dr. Christos. Um, so first off, we have Dr. Andrew Scheiber, who will be joining virtually. He's a medical doctor by training who works in harm reduction research programs and policy in South Africa and the region. So thank you for letting me join today. It's fantastic to be part of this session. I'm going to speak a little bit around the opioid agonist therapy training program developed by UNODC and WHO. And as we know, opioid dependence contributes significantly to morbidity and mortality. And the use of contaminated injecting equipment spreads the blood-borne infections, particularly HIV and viral hepatitis. And we know that opioid agonist therapy is very effective for the treatment of opioid dependence and is an effective harm reduction intervention. It, we know that OAT improves health outcomes and social outcomes and it also can improve people's adherence to antiretroviral therapy and other chronic medications. There is very good guidance available on how to implement opiate agonist therapy in a range of contexts, guidance from the World Health Organization, UNODC, and also collaborative guidance on how to develop these interventions and provide them in partnership with community organizations and networks. However, despite this guidance, we know that coverage of OAT is really far from what is needed. The 2022 Global State of Harm Reduction shows us in this map presented on your screen just how few countries provide opiate agonist therapy. Those that are gray, there's either no data or no AAT services. And in the light green, there's only at least one OAT service in a community setting. The few countries that are dark green are where OAT is available in the community as well as in prison. And just looking at data from 2016-17, at that stage, there were only 20 countries around the world 
that had at least 40% coverage of OAT. And we know that the 2025 target for the global AIDS strategy is to provide 50% of people with opioid dependence with access to OAT. So huge, significant scale-up is necessary for public health impact around opioid dependence and HIV. This training program is based on a tool that was developed collaboratively between UNODC and WHO, and it's intended to support professionals to establish and deliver evidence-based opioid agonist therapy. It aims to provide practical guidance on how to start, establish, roll out, and sustain quality services. And it's a focus on OAT in the context of HIV or viral hepatitis programs or in drug treatment settings. Important to note, it's not intended to be a clinical training because that can be subsequent and there is other guidance and resources for clinical training. And it doesn't focus specifically on the needs of providing OAT in the context of prison or in closed settings because of the unique circumstances of those environments. The target audience is largely for health policymakers, administrators of healthcare institutions, as well as health managers. The process was established and followed the guidance of a working group that included representatives from UN agencies, civil society organizations, and networks of people who use and inject drugs. There was a dread desk review of available guidance and other resources. There was consolidation of information from selected countries where OAT is available and is being scaled up, as well as synthesis of this information to develop a draft document, which re was reviewed, analyzed, and finalized. The tool is structured in several chapters, starting with an introduction. Later, there's a presentation of a framework around how the different components are presented. Then there are separate chapters for different phases of an OAT program. And then there's one chapter that looks at some of the nuances and issues of importance for providing OAT for specific populations. We have included various case studies that give examples of how countries in different contexts from Southeast Asia to North Africa to East Africa have developed and implemented OAT and scaled it up and shown to be an effective intervention. The main content is structured around various how-to questions, providing simple guidance, clear information, and also reference to more detailed guidance for specific issues. We've included a series of videos that are really testament to how OAT works. We've included the voices of people who themselves have used and benefited from OAT. We've included some interviews from organizations working in civil society, as well as technical experts and clinicians to reflect their experience and the country's experience of OAT scale-up. The module focusing on the framework takes an approach of how OAT programs expand over time, starting with initial groundwork, planning, scale up, moving towards sustainability, and the four main components of an OAT program. Importantly, including engagement with people who use opioids, uh, engaging and obtaining leadership and support, components relating to financing, the workforce, strategic information and medications, and also looking at elements of service delivery. The training program initially was developed to be delivered in a virtual format and has since been adapted to enable face-to-face -face training. It is based on the tool and the package involves a slide set with uh, training guides, as well as a range of interactive materials. We've aimed to include participatory methods and in the face-to-face -face version, the gender and program is tailored to allow more inclusion of local content and more time for engagement and discussion of key issues. The process to date was a two-year development process with initial manual development and then training tool development. 
and subsequently the starting of some of the training. The virtual training has been held with a group of stakeholders from UNODC as well as from Pakistan. And the first face-to-face -face training happened in November last year in Egypt. This year, there's been a training for stakeholders in Mozambique to prepare them as train the trainers for a series of events that will happen in that country. And later in this year, there are face-to-face -face and virtual trainings planned for several countries, including Zimbabwe, South Africa, Mozambique, India, Laos, Tanzania, Tunisia, and Iran. So this has been a collaborative process and really grateful for all the organizations and individuals involved. I really hope that this is something that can be used to increase access and scale up for this life-saving intervention. Thank you very much. So it's fantastic to see these very practical technical guidance tools developed by WHO and UN ODC, and importantly, they were developed in partnership with clients. I know there wasn't enough time to see the video examples, but having seen them before, you know, those video um, examples and testimonials really bring to life how critical, um, well-developed OAT programs are. Um, so next up, I'd like to introduce Richard Healy. He holds a PhD from the National University of Ireland. He'll be providing a service user perspective, but also the perspective um, of a researcher whose research has covered an exploration of narratives of service users through a human rights lens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, it's a real pleasure to be here and speaking today. Um, I find myself in a funny place. Um, I have a lot to thank Methadone for. You know, it's um, I got a PhD through Methadone. I'm a father through Methadone. Um, it's changed my life dramatically. It's done so many, so much good things for me. But yet, so much of my friends back at home aren't sharing and aren't sharing the same victory in their own lives, the same um, the same outcomes in their own lives. So we would be from um, a service-led um, called the Service Users' Rights in Action based out of Dublin. And we have inadvertently stumbled upon um, a model that has been used for service users um, evaluating the services themselves. So how did this come about? So it it's basically it consists of service users, former service users, uh, service providers found in 2012 and we've published I published a piece about um about a year ago called um it was called and my, what I noticed was that nearly everybody in the community all over Europe were identifying with the, what we were finding in Dublin were identifying with the same things that we were, we were finding in Dublin um that methadone had become very controlling in people's lives. There was no reintegration after methadone in people's lives. And we weren't seeing any of this. So what we, how did, did, did four service users really get, get, get this done? And I'm being asked to kind of translate this model into, into larger audiences. And I'm kind of a little bit embarrassed a little bit because there's, there's very little to it. It was, very, it was a very simple thing that came about. We're four or five service users with about 20 years each under our belts of um, using methadone services in Ireland. We got together. We realised that there was four main problems with panoptic services in Dublin. So there was no meaningful relationship with the GP. Frequency of your analysis, your analysis was just was based on everything. Um, no choice in treatment. And um, what we... We were operating on a human rights lens under a, um, the right to health, economic, social and cultural rights, um, Article 12. And um, we carried out four, four pieces of research to trace, um, if, if people are aware of that, of that right, Article 2 is progressive realisation, where it allows states to... Um, provide the highest attainable level of healthcare dependent on a state's resources. So what we've done to, to trace the, the narrative of drug service users, 
was we were able to trace a week by we were able to trace um do uh, research carried out after after a few years and to see if these four um primary key underpinning um damaging parts of methadone were still being carried out, which was your analysis, no choice in treatment, um, no independent or robust avenue for complaint and the frequency of your analysis. So we carried this on and you can skip on to the next one there, yeah. So we, we carried out the research and what we're finding is, and this is where I find myself in a, a really difficult part because I'm, I'm being critical of something that has been so empowering in my own life. It's allowed me to, be, to do a PhD. It's allowed me to speak over here. But yet, if we can see the stats up here, most people in, in, in Ireland are, um, if they're, there's about 12,000 methadone users in Ireland at the minute, 600 on Suboxone. So it's primarily methadone we're, we're talking about in, in Dublin. Um, and at the minute, we would have, it's, you, you, it's totally based on your urine sample. There's no relationship with a the doctor. There's no, you'd very rarely be asked how you are. You'd, you'd, that, so that wouldn't be, that, that wouldn't come into it whatsoever. No meaningful review with your doctor. Um, so what we have found is that we're, we're, we're getting a very aging methadone pop population in Ireland. Yeah, a research, and what, what we found is that, um, that we've, um, there's no meaningful review. We've um, we've we've got supervised urinalysis stopped so that there's the um, there's a far more um, a, the, the, there's no power imbalance when you're when you're engaging with your doctor. Your your doctor is is speaking to you as a patient as opposed to someone who's in treatment. Um, so that the whole word of being in recovery has been now being replaced by um, empowerment. And who you are as an as I wouldn't see myself in recovery. I would see myself as taking a medication every day to, to allow myself to operate at a pretty high standard in life. You know, so unfortunately we don't see that a lot in Dublin. Um, we we find highly entrenched with your analysis, highly um, controlled social um, control mainly, um, also on contracts. No quality of life, no reintegration, and we're, we're, we, we've no there's, there's there's no good outcomes. So what we what 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 we're ending up what's ending up happening is we are having an increasingly large methadone population <coughs> that's aging and that's not moving forward in any way. There's no reintegration. Where we would start with reintegration would be um, housing, job. Whereas methadone in Ireland stopped people from doing this, unfortunately. And this is where I find myself at that little ambiguity in my own life because it's helped me, but it, it's blocked so many others. And it's not methadone. It's not, it's not the medication. It's how it's been, it's how it's been dispensed, unfortunately. Unfortunately. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. It's really incredible research and definitely, you know, something um, very much worth uh, disseminating more broadly. And I think it's so powerful doing the research, but coming from that lived experience at the same time. So I'll just... Richie, thank you very much. And now I'm going to introduce uh, Christos Anastasiou. Uh, Christos is from Greece, as the name says. Uh, and he's a representative of the, of the Euro input. Uh, I know Christos very well from his uh, work in Greece and our, at times, positive collaboration, at times less so or challenging, but that's the point of all this, to enter discussions at the times can be difficult and challenging. Um, uh, Christo is going to talk about the OAT client guide and the positive solutions to OAT literacy rights from a Euro input point of view. Christos. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Christos. Ladies and gentlemen, and friends beyond the binary, I'm Christos from Athens and Euro output project manager of the client. Uh, oh, yeah. 
of, the, of a client they want service. Uh, this service started in Greece 27 years ago. I was the, I was the, back then I was a 246 client in an ex experimental unit in Exarchia. I have been stable si since 2004. I'm living proof of the benefits of what and the possibility of positive change. From the streets and the drug skin, we create a family and my, with my wife, who is also in Inuat, and now we have a daughter uh, is 18 years old. Also, the last 10 years, we managed to create the first network of people who use drugs in Greece, which is called PIRNAPS. We managed to connect with all international and European uh, peers and colleagues. Th these connections skyrocketed our knowledge and productivity and gave us the motivation. We feel an obligation to ensure that services become better, more efficient, and more accessible to customers. Since the beginning of the pandemic, we recognize the importance to renew the advocacy for people in OAT. So we started to research for the creation of uh, the OAT client guide. We talk at, uh, all over the world with colleagues and experts involved in what services and advocacy. And since we recruited peers in, uh, in, uh, on what in pilot countries uh, to form the what project team. Uh, next slide. Right. Yeah, okay. Uh, the objective of the project is to present in an accessible manner the best practice standards uh, for, for opioid agonist therapy based in the professional guidelines and science. To describe standards of, um, for the provision of what uh, that are consistent with the human rights principles, it also requires uh, that the primary objective to be the health and the well-being of the patient, not the cost of the convenience, to support the value of meaningful therapeutic relationship between people with opioid dependency and their award prescribers and the wider award team. To develop a third version of the new normal that uh, for the award provision based in a dynamic partnership between people with the opioid dependency and those who design, manage, and deliver what services, we are also to assure that services user, that service users involved in every decision making process that affects their treatment. Next slide. So this is the client guide. Oh. Uh, we developed this uh, what the client guide based in a research written from the, our peers from Canada. It's designed to be tailored and translated for use of different countries. We work to secure good sponsorship from governments, provide the professional partners, and this uh, requires a negotiation. Uh, our Swedish version has only three uh, OAT options, while the German one has seven. We want to provide people from around to, uh, with a great statement of their rights and the information leaflet. And to create a meaningful uh, therapeutic license, um, uh, in what uh, need to understand our rights and have confidence that raising issues about their treatment quality will not result in uh, treatment sanctions. Uh, next slide. Okay. Uh, policy makers and clinicians need to better understand that client education is a priority. Coming of the streets, people are looking to make positive change but they may not understand uh, the drug treatment system or what medication, and they and may worry about discrimination and health uh, from healthcare providers. Correct uh, scientific information is vital for empowering people with opioid dependency to get uh, more so out uh, of what and drug treatment. There are five main factors that typically need to be improved in what it's whether the well-being of the pe person, his income his living environment, um, his confidence in his department, um, uh, and uh, the social interactions uh, and less isolation. Having proven so on some or, or all of those factors is the health of a successful treatment. Clients of what service can be encouraged to form groups aimed to their growth. And, um, uh, Next slide. 
quality and status of the delivery of art is well described in, uh, in so many different uh, UN and other technical guidelines. We know that the art medications are highly effective and we know that works in terms of dosing, psychosocial support and other empower empowerment strategies. We need, needle, we need people in art uh, to be well informed and engaged in their own healthcare. Having drug user advocacy group for people in art is important, quality support structure, and the European offers our client guide um, as a strategy to help us create a meaningful therapeutic license so we can truly set what we are need together. Thank you. Uh, just uh, this is uh, the team that uh, make uh, the what uh, happened in seven different languages, and I want uh, you, most of them you know them. I don't want to, to say each one. Thank you. Thanks very much. I'm uh, sorry, my minister couldn't make it. She's uh, she was called away at the last minute, so I'm here in her behalf. Um, my name's Alison Crockett. I'm. Uh, Whole Systems Unit Head for the Drug Policy Division in uh, in the Scottish Government. Um, so it's really just to to welcome this short video that uh, is going to to be shown um, by a guy called Duncan Hill. I believe I don't know this, and so it's it's been uh, it's it's it's, it's uh, just really to to say that. Um, well, I guess to put it in context, to say that the. Oh, there he goes. <laughs> there, he, there he is, the very man. Do I, right. <laughs> Just to say that we have do, in Scotland, though, um, introduced as part of our drugs mission uh, medication assisted treatment standards. And, um, and they really um, are based on a number of principles, which is about um, creating an environment where people can um, access services quickly where they can access them with dignity and respect, where they can have some uh, choice and where they are given the support and uh, their well-being is, 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 is properly considered. And I, and I do think that this um, initiative will very much contribute to um, our success in Scottish Government of being able to successfully implement um, our standards. So just to say very much welcome this initiative um, very much welcome the, the, the work that you're doing and, and very much look forward to seeing them uh, rolled out in Scotland. Thank you. Can we have the video now? My name is Duncan Hill. I'm a specialist pharmacist in substance misuse in NHS Lanarkshire in Scotland. Um, in Scotland, we're fairly fortunate. We have specialist pharmacists working in all but one of the mainland health boards at the moment, so there's 14 of us, um, but we also have a, a wider network um, beyond that. Um, the reason I've um, come to, to speak to you and introduce um, how we're using the OAT client guide um, today is we connected to Matt via a, a long way, and that's what I'm going to explain, um, to obtain um, an agree uh, to change or adapt the the client guide to a more local um, Scottish kind of version that we could distribute to to patients uh, in Scotland. What set it all off was um, there was a paper um, done by the Scottish Government and SDF called Staying Alive, um, which started off looking at um, tackling drug related deaths in Scotland. As we know, we've got a, a fairly substantial challenge and our rates of death are, are tragically high um, and are three times higher than that of the rest of the UK and multiple times higher than um, the rest of Europe. And in the Staying Alive document, it mentioned um, developing or having a leaflet um, for patients so they could get informed decision making and what treatments offered and what benefits were. This was then backed up when the, the 10 MAT standards were developed. Now, the MAT standards are medica medication-assisted treatment standards. There's 10 of them that Scotland have launched um, in the last year, and we're now actively working towards them. Now, the standards were found 
by an initial 10 standards, and then they went out for consultation, including peer group consultation. Um, they came back and they were formulated. Um, and standard two of this looks at informed patient choice of treatment. And again, when we're looking through the leaflets that the, the addiction services have and all the drug companies have and all the other organisations, nobody had a single quick leaflet there was lots of leaflets available, um, all on individual treatments. Um, there were some who were very, very technical, some were very simple, um, but nothing that combined everything all together. So our alcohol and drug partnership in Lanarkshire um, were really keen that we we had this in place, both to tick the boxes for the Staying Alive document when we're tackling drug-related deaths, but also it ticked off the MAT standard. And uh, number two, where we could give information to patients for them to go away and actually have a think about what they would like to be treated with. So the ADP, obviously, very keen on using this. And I set off um, trying to find something. I had individual leaflets. I didn't have anything combined. So as I said, um, the specialist pharmacist, we have a group of us. So we all communicate regularly and discuss things. So went to them to see if anybody else had a, a leaflet that combined all the treatments and nobody did. Then went back to the Drug Death Task Force at the Scottish Government and the local ADP and drug-related death groups as well. And nobody um, in Scotland had a, a combined leaflet on different treatment options. So then I had to cast the net a little bit wider and contact some colleagues down south. And that's when I was quite fortunate that one of the people I'd reached out to had recently reviewed the Euro input leaflet um, on the OAT guide, which Matt had been involved in, in developing. Um, this was great because I'd met Matt previously um, and we'd worked on a couple of conferences um, in, in the past. I reached out to Matt, Matt came straight back. It was still at the final stages um, and Matt and the Euro Enpud group were quite happy that we took the leaflet and adapted it for some of the terms were more or less appropriate for the Scottish audience, but also some of the contents and the contacts, we changed them. So once we had the finalised leaflet, which changed not significantly, um, quite a few minor changes, but it was more just, um, as I said, it was some of the wording uh, was used. And we have kept the, the essence of the leaflet written by peers for peers. Um, we contacted a couple of the organisations such as Advocacy, Drug, Scottish Drugs Forum, um, the Drug Death Task Force and Scottish Families Affected by Drugs. And we've got their agreement to have their contact details onto the back of the leaflet, making it much more um, for Scotland. But it takes basically the patient through a number of the different options and treatments that are available. And we've also kept in some of the ones that are available in Europe, but not available in Scotland, such as slow release morphine. But again, that's something that we might eventually move towards. So the fact that we've already highlighted that this could be a, a potential treatment and a leaflet, it means that we're open to discuss that with the patients going forward. No, it's great to hear about how the resources are being used. Um, so just turning to Paula Kearney from Ireland um, as our last speaker. She's a community development worker who has a history of incarceration um, and is now a human rights and drug policy advocate pushing for better access to health and rights for women who use drugs. Thanks, Paula. I'll apologise before I start because I've a Northern City Dublin accent, so if anyone can't understand, put your hand up and I will slow down a bit. Um, as says, my name's Paula Kearney, I'm a community development worker from Northern City Dublin and I'm passionate about human rights and drug policy changes for people who use drugs, but particularly for women who use drugs. For over 20 years of my life, I was also an active addiction myself. And I have been on every OIT available in Ireland from Fiseptone, Methadone, the whole lot, even Buvidal. But we're very fortunate in Ireland that we do have OITs because I do recognise there are many countries that don't. So 
like I wouldn't have been able to move on from using illicit drugs if I hadn't got the option of OATS. So like I wouldn't have been able to go on to university and get the qualifications required for me to work in the sector that I do. Sorry, I'm very nervous when I'm talking. Um, and as well, as a woman, as a working woman and a mother, I've had major struggles with moving on in my career regarding treatment. Like, you know that, having to get up every day, go to clinics and all. So the fact that Bilvidal is available in Ireland, I know it's only available on trial at the moment, but it, it allows for people to move on in their lives and not have that daily struggle of getting up and going to clinics, you know, and sort of taking that part of someone's life. So it has had, like, major improvements, you know what I mean? It means that you no longer have to explain whether it's to your boss, whatever, you know, making them excuses to go to clinics. People can get up and move on in their life, you know. But up until last year, I worked in an amazing service in the North and I called the Sale Project. And it's a project that works with women who use drugs or women that are in recovery from drug use. Uh, but I've seen firsthand, the, you know, them extra struggles for women that they have when it comes to getting recovery. Like women who use drugs, they're judged much more harshly than men are. They're stigmatised really badly, and then if they're a mother, they're stigmatised even further. It's just an extra level of shame that's placed upon them, and then they end up internalising that, that shame, which makes it very hard for them to move on in their lives. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, that, because of that stigma, it frequently leads to them staying in their addiction, because they know that once they register in an OAT clinic, that just that light being shone on them, and then shone on their mother and skills as well. And it's not like, it's like as if a person who uses drugs is automatically seen as a bad mother, when that's not the case. But flexibility is also an issue for women. Many women who try to enter residential treatment, they face barriers because they're usually the care of the family. Even in cases where they may be parenting with a partner, you know that there is two parent household, there's usually an addiction on both sides. And the women end up, I'm sure any of us that are mothers here know that regardless of what we're doing, we still have to get up, get the kids to school. If I'm talking too fast, just kind of let me know. But you know, getting the kids to school, doing the housework. And but when it comes to a woman who uses drugs, a lot of times she's also the breadwinner in the family. She's the one who earns the money, you know, and for it, like to feed, feed our kids, but also to feed our habit, but also our partner's habit in many cases as well. But that, and that, definitely leaves her in you no know, very precarious situation because if, particularly if a woman is on methadone and she's going to the clinic five to seven days a week, she can't really take up employment. So she's held in that space and it leaves her in a precarious situation because then she has to sort of use informal ways of getting money. And for many it could be shoplifting or even sex work. You know, and that again leaves her vulnerable to HIV, hepatitis C and all the issues that come along with it. Sorry, Mel Petroy. Um, excuse me for a minute. I got lost. But um, yeah, but as well, it leaves her open to jail time. Do you know what I mean? Criminality and jail time. But as well, now, like a lot of the women that I would have walked with would have been starting to get a bit of stability in their life. And then they'd end up getting into a little bit of trouble, going into jail. And that stability is taken from them because they may have been on daily, the weekly takeouts in their clinic. But then once, thank you. Thanks. But so I'm a bit nervous. I'll be grand. Look, shakes. But um, yeah, once she ends up going into prison, that weekly takeout that she's at again, that bit of sort of normality into her life is taken from her. So if she's missing clinics or anything like that, there's a risk of her relapsing when she comes out. And as well as that, there's a risk of her tolerance being low as well and all the usual issues that come. <laughs> but if there's young children, do you know what I mean, and the woman does miss the clinic, again, them risks of relapsing. Women who use drugs as well, they experience a lot more gender-based violence than women in general. But there's a different view on them. They're almost seen as complicit victims. They're not seen as a woman who is going through domestic abuse or a woman who has been sexually abused or anything. They're not seen as innocent victims. And this stops women from actually reporting because if they feel that when they report to the police, again, there's the chances of social workers and all, women are less likely to report. So there needs to be a sort of really understanding of the different issues that women have. Do you know, like them things that you really need to take into account, that it's not just as straightforward as it is for men who use drugs. 
<laughs> they feel that there's, like, even when it comes down to reporting, you know, the police place a lot of the blame on the woman as well because of the, a lot of the times the argument may be over or drugs or whatever. So they're just extra barriers that women do face. Um, that's the same thing. Their drug use comes under scrutiny if they do report it to the guards. And again, they have to start proving themselves, you know what I mean? And that whole part of them being a victim is just taken from them. Yeah, but sorry about this. I'm a little bit mixed up on my thing. I should have just read. <laughs> I hate reading. I hate reading. I get a little bit lost, sorry. But yeah, so as I was saying, the women who do use drugs and are going through domestic abuse in Ireland, there's no escape for them. Because if a woman is on OAT or if a woman is using drugs, um, women's shelters mm -hmm. do not take women in Ireland when it comes to drug use. Mm -hmm. I don't know whether that's an issue everywhere, mm -hmm. but in Ireland they don't take them in. And that even comes down to a woman being on methadone. <laughs> that's how they're not allowed to go in with the methadone. So there needs to be services tailored to the needs of women. Do you know, tailored to the extra barriers that women who use drugs face. And there's not enough of them. In, well, I'll speak for Ireland because I don't really know. Do you know as well as that, there is also a huge homeless crisis now in Ireland at the moment. And the negative repercussions for women who use drugs within that is really bad because a lot of women end up in emergency accommodation. And if they may be talked into, I'm going to use this, voluntarily handing over you know, the care of their children to family members, sorry, one more minimum. <laughs> to family members and all, you know. But then when it comes to them getting their children back, they're told that um, because they're, they need stability in order to get their children back, but if they're in an emergency accommodation and it's, they haven't got care of their children, they no longer fit the criteria when it comes to the council of, for their three bedroom house or whatever is required. So then they're in a catch 22 that they cannot you know, go on and take their children back unless there's stability there. But then the, the, the other one that the children have done. So apology for all matters running me up there. <laughs> See, I didn't use any of my speech. Okay. But yeah, as I was saying at the beginning, we are very fortunate in Ireland to have OAT services. <coughs> but women should be able to avail of the treatment of their choice. Like as Richie was saying, I'd be part of the service users rights in action myself. And there are many women who are being given methadone and feel, do you know what I mean, that the doctor doesn't listen to them when they say they want to detox. It's always, it's, they, that autonomy is never there for them. They can never make them choices themselves. Or even if they want to choose other OAT services within it, because as much as we have different alternatives, it's predominantly methadone because that's a cheaper version as well. They feel that you don't have a say in their own treatment plan. Doctors need to give some autonomy to service users and allow them other forms of OAT. And when drug policy and drug treatment policies are being created, there needs to be a focus on the additional needs of women who use drugs. Childcare services need to be provided so that you know women can seek support, but it also ensures that going to an OAT service isn't part of a child's everyday life. Mm. Do you know that? And there's nothing wrong with bringing the child to a clinic, but you don't want that for a child neither every single day. And I'll end with this, like, this year's theme for International Women's Day was, em was to embrace equity. And we need to consider that, that there are additional needs for women. So if we want to have a fairer policy for women who use drugs, we need to embrace equity and provide the right supports for people. Yeah. Sorry for going on. <laughs> I should have just read. <laughs> Cool. I think we did a really good job with time. We're pretty much exactly on time. So thank you so much for all the speakers, for all the excellent interventions, um, and also staying within the time frame. I think there are a lot of important insights, and it showed you know the range of value that peers bring in terms of research, um, also providing technical resources and technical expertise that is grounded in lived experience. 
Um, just finally, just, you know, really want to emphasize your point as well, Dr. Richard Healy, when you talked about the ambiguity, because I also think as peers, you know, we are caught in this, you know, of course, being, you know, really grateful and appreciative of having access, which many people do not have. It is life changing, but I think we are invested in critiquing it because we want to make it better because there are times where, you know, it can be very punitive and all about control. Um, so just to emphasize the importance of partnerships, you know, working across all stakeholders to really improve the way OAT program services are delivered, um, designed and delivered. And just thank you, your input as well for this excellent side event. Could I have one minute? Just came to my mind. Um, as a doctor, you referred quite a lot in the, your relationship with the doctor and so forth. And I have to say that stigma exists not only to people receiving services, uh, but also doctors <coughs> working within those services. Uh, there are times in certain countries that are not looked at as good as the rest of our colleagues. Mm -hmm. That's number one. Number two is that unless you are well trained in your trade, in your science, you can be easily uh, guided by your own preconceptions and you can easily be afraid of the person you have in front of you. You might not be confident enough of how to mitigate between risks from or side effects from the medication or how uh, to uh, navigate through the system. So education and training of the doctors and the health professionals providing the service is crucial and is something that we can work to advocate, uh, you can work together to advocate on that. And the third has to do with the uh, system where they, these services are operating. If the system is looking for a mistake from the side of the health professional to criticize them and take the licensing way, then of course they will be very, very uh, conservative into uh, cut corners or take an initiative to address uh, your needs. So it is not you and us, we're both together into promoting better services, better training and better understanding and collaboration. And, that, and thank you for inviting me to this amazing event. Thank you.